Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt for ACC.org, and I'm here with my two good friends, Roxana Moran and Bin Ahmed, to discuss the trials from the first day of TCT this Saturday, where there's already been a lot of great stuff. Well, welcome, Roxana and Bina. It's wonderful to have you. Great to be with you. Thanks for having so, me. Maybe we can start with Protected Taver. That was perhaps the biggest trial of the day. And uh, Bina, maybe you just want to, in a nutshell, encapsulate for the audience what that showed. Yeah, the, the trial was uh, looking at cerebroembolic protection uh, among patients undergoing TAVR, randomized controlled trial, large um, amount of patients in both the arms. And similar to what we had seen in the smaller Sentinel trial, when they looked at uh, the endpoints of um, uh, disabling stroke or, or any ischemic stroke, there really was no difference uh, between the two groups. So cerebral embolic protection did not provide um, a reduction in, in stroke rates among TAVR patients. Yeah, uh, what did you think, Roxana, of this finding? Maybe a bit counterintuitive to what at least yeah, some people were I mean, expecting. To be honest with you, I was, I'm surprised uh, because I think we've all been um, convinced with some of the results and at, at our centers with really good Good outcomes and re reduction of those important events. Um, I do want to point out regarding the disabling stroke, 1.5 down to 0.3, and that's sort of a interesting, but it's a secondary endpoint. You have to go back and say, wow, um, this was a massive trial, 3,000 patients, uh, and I think it is. Um, it's uh, it's disappointing not to see a wow positive result. I must say. I think only about 10, 15% of TAVRs in the US are getting this sort of protection device utilization. Obviously there's a cost associated to it. Uh, there's some added complexity to doing any sort of additional procedure at the time of TAVR. Bean, I don't know if you were a believer or not before, but um, what will the impact of this trial be on your practice? Yeah, I you know I was waiting for the the data for the, the larger randomized trial and um, it is disappointing. Um, uh, like you said, intuitively, it makes sense that cerebral protection would result in less stroke rates, but um, uh, there is something to be said about doing this in all comers versus trying to find a subset uh, or a group that does benefit. And I think I'm hoping that this data allows us to identify maybe a, a subset of patients that would benefit as opposed to doing it in everyone. Is that your interpretation, Roxana? Or do you 100% think? and I couldn't say it any better. And I think in my mind, you know, you know, there are centers that are using this exclusively unless otherwise not able to put in, and our center is one of those. And it really will make us rethink that because all of these are costly. But at the same time, um, you know, seeing the numeric reduction in the disabling stroke that matter to patient is, is not something to walk away from either. So I'm sure there'll be more than meets the eye. Terrific. All right, well, maybe we can briefly discuss uh, the amulet trial uh, looking at the amulet and watchman left atrial appendage closure devices. The earlier time point data had been presented. This is longer term follow-up. And the bottom line is both devices seem to look really good and seem to perform really well. Uh, any thoughts about this one? Maybe Bina, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think uh, important to keep in mind uh, that they were comparing the uh, version 1 or 1.0 version of the Watchman, uh, which was the 2.5. Uh, we've moved on to using the Flex device. And when comparing um, the 2.5 to the Amulet, the three-year data looks good for both. Um, there is a signal for more uh, systemic anticoagulation use in the Watchman group, but it didn't amount to more bleeding outcomes um, so I think this provides reassurance. We may have two options on the shelf for, um, you know, for left atrial appendage closure. Uh, both seem to be durable and, uh, and come with good outcomes. Yeah. Uh, did you make anything at all, Roxana, or should we about the p-value of, I think it was 0.07 uh, for all cause mortality that is um, in favor numerically uh, for the amulet? I thought that was really, really very important, and I'm uh, um, I'm really glad to see that they went for this longer term follow up, and now we may have a second uh, device available. And I think those all of them, I I 
I never make anything out of a p-value of 0.07. I'm always, hmm, what does that really mean, right? And, but it's an important, uh, important outcome for us to kind of think about. And now we have another choice of another device for, uh, and I believe that this entire field will open up to many more devices, hopefully. Uh, I do believe that we have to, a lot more work to do in that particular space, especially against uh, direct oral anticoagulants. So it'll be very interesting to, to see that. Yeah, no, agree. I think it's good to have two approved devices that seem to have, I think, quite reasonable long-term data. Uh, maybe the final trial we can cover is a class B one. Uh, Bina, any uh, thoughts you want to share with the audience about that overall design and, and finding? Yeah, so um, that that trial uh, was a non-inferiority design looking, um, uh, comparing two options for treating degenerative um, mitral regurgitation, so mitroclip um, versus um, the Pascal system. And uh, again, good to know that there soon will be another option on the shelf when considering therapy for degenerative MR. The data looked good, non-inferior. Um, uh, and so we'll see how this rolls out. It was uh, sort of a small subset of patients, but I think uh, longer term follow up and, and larger groups will be helpful. Yeah, a lot of uh, think, good data there. Do you think there, we, I have think. A, we have enough to go with? A, a, I, I think we need a much larger trial. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see that, but that to me is just sort of the beginning of uh, figuring out to make sure that we have another device that's just as durable and as effective. We only have data on a small, you know, it's a small numbers of patients. I, I hope you both agree on that. Well, I was going to ask you, Roxanne, a bit of a statistical question. The trial, as you know, was uh, stopped early for a pre-specified interim analysis, uh, although in the context of a non-inferiority trial. And there were a lot of fancy statistics associated with that. But, but what were your thoughts about that? You know, and we've seen this now in the TAVR space, right? When we have disruptive technology, we're using a lot of like Bayesian analyses, early stopping and, you know, interim. Um, and, and I think it's all well taken, but at the same time, I always, always would like to see much larger patient population before I say, I now have another device equivalent to what I've had before to use. And there may be even um, advantages to this particular device over the clip. Uh, and you know, over, over the mitral club. We won't know unless we study larger numbers of patients, but it seems to me that this particular, at, at this particular juncture, that there aren't any signals of harm, certainly, and that it's looking pretty good. And I, um, I never like a early stoppage. That's why people like to keep me in DSMVs. Uh, <laughs> I do, and as you know, you're, you're in the same, uh, you're in the same boat. And I, that's why I love to have you on my DSMV <laughs> always, uh, Dr. Bot. So I, um, I would say, um, you know, uh, we have these data. It's exciting to see another kid on the block, but I think we would like to see more. Yeah, yeah, no, really valuable points by both of you. Well, it's been a great first day. Hopefully the audience enjoyed this brief recap of some of the highlights. For more coverage, tune into acc.org. Thanks. <laughs>